I have a couple of things. First of all, the parents that took the videos, keep those videos in a safe place for years because they would just be perfect to show at their weddings. <laughs> yes. Uh, we made a, some, a couple of little changes for security reasons, and I want everybody to know, as soon as church starts, Andrew is going to lock three of the four doors out in the front. The only door that will be open will be the first door as you go out. Now, you can go out any of the doors. That has nothing to do with it. It's coming in. So if you come late to church and the door's locked, go around until you find the door that's open. We're going to put signs up also that will say these doors are locked during the service. Also, that door over there will be locked once the service starts. So if you're coming late from Sunday school or whatever and you see that door locked, just come around to the front. <clears throat> That's a, a security measure that we're, we're implementing this week. Um, that's all I had. No, it's not all I had. On your way out today, if you didn't pick one up on the way in, pick up an annual business meeting uh, agenda. We're having our annual business meeting. We only have one a year. We have it next Sunday after church, okay? So if you, have, if you want to know what's going to go on, this is the agenda, and it also has a, a, all the information about how we spend our money, the proposed budget for next year, and all that kind of stuff. So be sure and pick one of these up on your way out today. Well, if you were here in 2012 and you have a really good memory, you might recognize some of the sermon that I'm going to preach today because you've heard part of it before. Here we are in November, and I can already smell the turkey. <laughs> I can smell that turkey. A few weeks, we'll all gather with our families. We'll stuff our faces until we're almost sick. We'll eat so much turkey and dressing and desserts We'll need a wrecker to get us to the couch where we will fall asleep while we're watching football. Later, we'll wake up and realize there's still pumpkin pie on the kitchen table. And because we don't like to eat sweets by themselves, we'll go ahead and make us a turkey sandwich to go along with it. We call this holiday Thanksgiving. But we've really forgotten that it means giving thanks. Like Christmas, many people have forgotten the reason for this holiday. Many of us can't even remember the history lesson we were taught as children. If you ask most people the origin of Thanksgiving, they will tell you something like, oh, it was a bunch of pilgrims and some Indians got together and they killed some turkeys and had a big feast. Let me give you just a quick history lesson. It was the fall of 1621, one year after the pilgrims had landed. There was great affliction in their voyage. 102 pilgrims left Holland. They stopped briefly in England before sailing to America. They were at sea for 66 days. There was fierce storms in the Atlantic, so severe that at halfway point, the sailors debated on whether or not to turn around and go back to England. Their accommodations were limited. All 102 pilgrims were below the deck in the ship's hold, which is much smaller than a volleyball court. With the hatches closed to keep out the sea, the air grew foul, making their seasickness even worse. There were no fires, very little water. Two pilgrims did not survive the journey, but there were two that were born during the journey. When they landed in Massachusetts, they had no place to go. There were no villages, no stores, no one to welcome them, and no way to restock their ship. 
They lived on and off the ship, surviving basically on the ship's provisions through the first winter. They built one makeshift building and lived in fear of the Indians, who they did not know. They were supposed to land somewhere north of the current New York City on the Hudson River, but strong winds kept them from getting there. 47 of the 102 pilgrims died that first winter. A man by the name of William Bradford was the first governor of the new colonies. In the year two, uh, 1621, he proclaimed a day of thanksgiving or giving thanks to God in celebration of the survival of the second year in the new world. They weren't thanking God for turkeys. They were thanking God for their lives. Two years later, Governor Bradford issued a proclamation, and I would like to read that proclamation to you this morning. It says, To all pilgrims, inasmuch as the Great Father has given us this year an abundant harvest of Indian corn, wheat, peas, squash, and garden vegetables, and made the forest to abound with game and sea with fish and clams, and as much as he has protected us from the raids of the savages, has spared us from pestilence and disease, has granted us freedom to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience, now I, your magistrate, do proclaim that all pilgrims with your wives and your little ones do gather at the meeting house on the hill between the hours of 9 and 12 in the, day, uh, in the daytime on Thursday, November the 29th, in the year of our Lord, 1,623, the third year since the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock, and there to listen to your pastor and render thanksgiving to Almighty God for his blessings. Some of you here today may not know what it is to be thankful for our basic needs. When was the last time you thanked God for peas? When was the last time that you thanked God for squash? These pilgrims have been through some rough times. They left their families, they left their homeland, and they spent months and months on a tiny boat hoping to find the colonists that had settled in Virginia some 13 years before. Instead, they landed in the wilds of what is now Massachusetts. They named it Plymouth. They had endured hard winters, disease, wild animals, wild Indians, but they trusted God to provide their needs, and he did. When is the last time you thank God for being able to worship him? Our scripture today tells of another Thanksgiving day. Let's look at Luke 17, if you have your Bibles. We'll start with verse 11. It says, As Jesus continued toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were healed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus, shouting, Praise God. He fell at the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samarian. Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. We see Jesus on the road traveling to Jerusalem when he comes near a town and some men meet him from afar. Now, the rules back then were a little different than they are today. Back then, if you had a communicable disease, such as leprosy, which is a skin disease, you were forced to live in an area outside of the town. You also could not come within 100 feet of any person, and you had to shout, unclean, unclean, to let everyone know you were diseased. Apparently, these men had heard of Jesus and of his healings. So when they saw him coming into the town, they began to shout, have mercy on us. Some of you have heard me give the definition, the difference between mercy and grace. 
because sometimes they're often confused. So if you haven't heard it, I'll give it to you again. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Think about that. These men called him master, which shows that they knew Jesus had the authority to heal them. Jesus had mercy on them and told them to go show themselves to the priest. Now note that the priests are pure, plural. <clears throat> and that's because there were so many of them. Every family had a priest. The law of the day said that if you recovered from a disease like this, you would go and show yourself to, priest, to the priest and he would proclaim you were healed. The scripture said they were, these men were healed as they went. Jesus healed them. Going before the priest had nothing to do with the healing. It was just the law that they had to do. They were all healed, but we see one of these people turning around, realizing he'd been healed by Jesus, coming and falling at his feet and thanking him. Now, we also see that this man was a Sumerian. Why is that mentioned? Well, the Jews hated the Samaritans because they were Gentiles. Luke wanted us to know that Jesus was no respecter of persons. It didn't matter to Jesus that this man was a Samaritan. He didn't care. It only mattered to Jesus that this man had realized something wonderful had happened in his life because of this man, Jesus. Only a short time before, this man's life was terrible. He had no reason to live, but Jesus changed his perspective on life. Jesus had given him back his life. He could return to his home, to his family, to the life that he once had. He was thankful. He was very thankful. He'd been told to go to the priest, but he disobeyed. He realized that a higher calling and that that must become first. He praised God for what he had done in his life. Jesus' only reply to this man was, were not all ten men healed? Where are the other nine? You know, we're all somewhat like those lepers. We're all infected with a terrible, incurable disease that only Jesus can heal. The disease is called sin. If you're a Christian, you called out to Jesus to show mercy on you, and Jesus healed you. You did not deserve to be healed, but through his mercy, you were healed. Are you one who gave thanks? Are you one of the nine? who never gave thanks. You know, we live in a country that is so blessed, so blessed, but many of us take our blessings for granted. Most of us have grown up in a world with no lack. Everything we want was available. We take this for granted today. We don't worry that there won't be any tomatoes at HEB. HEB always has tomatoes. We don't worry that there won't be any shoes at Payless. Payless always has shoes. We don't worry that there won't be gasoline at the Shell station. The Shell station always has gasoline. Sometimes not. I read something the other day that said we might run out of gasoline someday. Could that really happen? What if it did? James, what if it did? How would we get to H-E-B to get tomatoes? How would we get to Payless to buy shoes? How would we get to church? I might need to borrow Jimmy's horse. Now most of us have grown up in a world without want. There's some folks here today who have grown up in a world with want. We didn't always have H-E-B. We didn't always have Payless, and we didn't always have Shell. There was a time in this country, if you wanted fresh tomatoes, you grew them. There was a time, if you wanted new shoes, you made them. There was a time that if you wanted to go somewhere, you saddled your horse, and you went. We become spoiled, so spoiled and so unthankful. We thank God for granted. He blesses us every day with so much and we never thank him. 
When was the last time you thanked God for the air that you breathe, the sun that keeps us alive? I'm not talking about the things that God blesses us with. I'm talking about the blessings that we never even think about. I'm sure there are many people in the world just thanking God for being alive today. Thank you, God, so that we can come into this house of prayer. Thank you, God, that you gave us a Savior so that even though we don't deserve it, we can have everlasting life. Thank you, Jesus, for doing the job you were sent to do. Thank you, God, for creating the world that is so perfect that your creation cannot improve it. Oh, yeah, we can make things better, to make our life better, but only God can deliver you from the depths of hell through his son, Jesus Christ. Psalms 107 reminds us, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Do you thank the Lord for his wonderful deeds? Let me tell you a story of his wonderful deeds that happened to Linda and me a few, few years back while we were on vacation. We've been driving all day long, coming back to Texas. And we finally got to a motel in St. Louis. We unloaded the car and we laid down to rest for a few minutes. And just before dark, we decided to go get something to eat. We looked on the internet and we found a restaurant that was pretty close to the hotel. We went out, got in the car, and it wouldn't start. I assumed it was a dead battery, so I called a wrecker. He came over, checked the battery, said, it's not your battery, it's your starter. Well, it was late, everything was closed. So we walked across the street to a little place and ate something there. We got up the next morning and I asked the record driver if I could call him in the morning and he could come tow us to the dealership so we could get a new starter. He agreed to do that for $250. Well, the next morning I got up, I loaded the car, and just as I was about to call the guy, I said a prayer. I asked God to let the car start. Guess what? Started right up. That short prayer saved us $250. And that's good because the starter cost us $500. <laughs> Linda and I praise God anyway. And we thanked him all the way to the dealership. We got a new starter and we continued our trip home. Do you remember to thank God when he does something good in your life? Psalm 107, starting verse 21, says, Let them praise the Lord for his great love and his wonderful things he's done for them. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. Thanksgiving is all about giving thanks. It's not about pilgrims or turkey or football games. It's about being the one instead of being one of the nine. It's about praising God for the things that he has done in your life. Maybe this year's not been the best year for you. Maybe some things have gone wrong. Maybe everything's not going your way. But our praise and thanksgiving is not or should not be based on our circumstances, but on God. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us, Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. You see, it's not about us. It's about Him. It's about who He is. It's about His love for His creation. 1 Chronicles 16. Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim His greatness. Let the whole world know what He has done. Sing to him. Yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. Now, since the pilgrims had a proclamation, I decided that I would write a proclamation, and I would like to read it to you now. To all you pilgrims at Delview, inasmuch as God, our Heavenly Father, has given us this year everything we need to survive and thrive, 
And as much as he has protected us from the attacks of Satan, has spared us from death, has granted us freedom to worship the God of our forefathers, has granted us the freedom, I'm sorry, has blessed us to live in the greatest country that's ever been. So now I proclaim that all you pilgrims, along with all your wives, your children, your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles, gather at your homes between the hours of 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. on Thursday, November the 22nd, the year of our Lord, 2018, and 389th year since the pilgrims landed, and there to give thanks to Almighty God for all of his blessings. This Thanksgiving, as you gather with your friends and your relatives, don't be one of the nine. Be one of the one. Give him thanks for what he deserves. Ephesians 5.21 tells us, And give thanks for everything God the Father, in the name of Jesus our Lord, or Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. This Thanksgiving, make it a day of worship. Make it a day of praise. Will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, as we gather this week to, to proclaim a, a day dedicated to you, help us to remember the reasons for the holiday. Help us not to be like the nine who never said thank you, but help us to be the one who realized that you've given us everything that we need in this life and the next. Lord, if there's someone here today that has not received your gift of salvation, then, Lord, I ask that you touch their heart this morning. Let this be the day that they become like the one who returned to thank Jesus for healing their body and in return received everlasting life. We thank you, Lord, for healing us from our sin. We thank you, Lord, for your gift of salvation. And we thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, who sacrificed his life that we might live. Amen. <clears throat> we will now celebrate the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26, 26 tells us, As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks for, to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Drink each of you from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Our celebration of the Lord's Supper is open to all believers. Parents, we will trust you to determine if your children should partake of the Lord's Supper today. We'll pass out the, the bread and then the juice, and please wait until all have been served, and we will partake together. Will the deacons come forward now to receive the elements? 